Hi, I'm Reinhold Wilcox. I'm a PhD student at Monash University, which means I'm studying to be a doctor in astrophysics. I study uh, binary stellar evolution, which means uh, I look at models of binary stars to see how they evolve. And I do this by looking at simulations of whole populations of binary stars. And I make predictions on things like rates of double neutron stars or double black holes, things that you'll hear about in just a moment. Hello everyone, I'm Debotri. I'm a PhD student with Ozgraph. Um, I create dead stars like black holes or neutron stars and I make them bump into each other either in an isolated environment where there are no stars around or I make them collide with each other, interact with each other in a very dense collection of uh, stars called globular clusters. And I model them because I want them to merge into each other and create gravitational waves. And uh, these things will be discussed very soon now. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be there on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube answering. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name's Kendall. Um, I'm a master's student at the University of Adelaide with the Osgrave node there. Um, I'm studying the use of machine learning to analyze the signals from um, black holes and uh, other objects that create gravitational waves. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this live cast and I'll be here to answer questions. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Poojan. I'm a PhD student at Swinburne University of Technology here in Melbourne. And for my PhD, I study stars, their lives, and how they behave as a community. And my main focus are those big blue stars that you see in Syria. Those stars are more than 10 times the mass of sun and are really cool. So if you have any questions about those stars or in general about uh, lives of stars, do ask the question and enjoy today's session.
Welcome all to National Science Week. You're joining us on, well, for me, a very wet and wintry weekend. I hope wherever you are experiencing this National Science Week event, Immersive Science, it is a fun and enjoyable day already. And we certainly have a lot of fun ahead as we take a tour through the virtual universe using the Science in VR app. Now, I know a lot of you are already at um, uh, regional venues or hosted venues. So hopefully you've got your headsets and everything else set up already. If not, don't worry, we're gonna show you a little bit more detail uh, uh, in a minute or so on how to set this up. For now, I just wanted to welcome you all. My name is Professor Alan Duffy. Joining me from, uh, from indeed the United States of America is my Swinburne colleague, Dr. Rebecca Allen. We have uh, a team of astronomer volunteers across Australia who will try to answer your questions if you use the hashtag AskSciVR, either on Facebook, Twitter, or in the bottom of the YouTube comments. Um, they'll even be passing those to us in, in real time, so we'll try to answer them as best we can live. But if we don't get to them, they will be responding to you all as well. Now, without further ado, I want to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I, I'm meeting or streaming you all now, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, no matter where in this great country you find yourselves standing. Now, we have this uh, uh, idea of the night sky, of, of the heavens above being fixed and unchanging. And today we're gonna to take you through a tour that shows that's anything but. Before we launch into this, this night sky, this virtual tour, however, it's time to get used to your app. And we have a beautiful way for you to get a bit more proficient at that. And that is in our acknowledgement of country scene. So Rebecca, take Absolutely. it away. So I just wanted to start by saying, welcome everyone. You know, we're really sad that we can't be doing this in person with you, but we're so excited that all of our regional libraries who are online are joining us. So I just want to give a shout out to Bundaberg. You guys already have some great questions online that we'll get to. Denmark, Lab Rats, again, Osgrave in Perth, Kingston in Tasmania, Bendigo Discovery Center, Parks Library, Coded in Denmark. I think that's that's everybody right now. Uh, we can't wait to see you guys join in. Let's let's jump in though. So as you can see um, on the screen, we have you know where you should be starting with this app. So make sure you've got your uh, headset on your phone and that you're entering the app in VR mode. So make sure that that's clicked and press start. And we're going to get in, underway and go into the scene as Alan has described. So now we're in our home screen and you can see some beautiful examples of the tools that astronomers love to use. We've got some radio telescopes, we've got some optical telescopes and there's even some space telescopes. And remember, as you're cruising through this, it's look up, look down, look left, look right. It's not just right in front of you. There's cool stuff everywhere. You're in virtual reality now. So let's go ahead and look down and we're going to see our menu. So you should see several icons, okay? And what you're gonna do is when you hover over something you can interact with, you'll see a bright green circle. And that means you can tap your screen and you can fly away to that scene. So we're going to start by looking at those icons and we're gonna turn all the way to the right to our acknowledgement of country scene, which is in the beautiful shape of the country of Australia. So let's enter that scene. And now what we see is in front of us is a wonderful map. So we're going to kind of look up. We're in this great room and we're going to see this map of Australia. And what you'll notice is there's a lot of little shapes and these are much smaller than the big state lines. These actually represent all of the different languages of the indigenous peoples of Australia. So you can see there's not just one or two, there's many, many different ones. And so if you take your green circle and you hover over one of those areas and you press down, now you'll notice you'll see a little zoom in of that area of the map. And so you can actually learn the different languages of those peoples. So there's an example there. And so we encourage you 
to explore this map, find out all about the wonderful different peoples, indigenous peoples of Australia, who were the very first astronomers. They are the ones that found these patterns in the sky. And as we're gonna to explore tonight, we're seeing the first people to recognize that we live in a dynamic universe and that there are objects in that night sky which change. So I think it's time to hop into that night sky. Alan, what do you say? Should we head off to our, our first scene? Let's do it. All right, so if you can all go back to the, the home menu, so uh, that's where you press the little house icon. So move your headset over until you're there, it's green, tap the screen, and you should jump back to the starting menu. And then I want you to, yep, so press go. There we are. And if you pan to the left, so as Rebecca mentioned, you know, make sure you're, you're safe and you've got space around you. You should all be socially distancing anyway, right? So that's fine. Um, go to solar system. That's where the planets are and tap. And then you will definitely know when that's worked because you should see a very large star in front of you. Now this is the sun. And if you look off towards the right, you can see the other planets of our solar system arrayed out um, in their uh, order from closest to the sun, Mercury, and then Venus, and then further out. And again, if you keep zooming off to, uh, sorry, turning to the right, you'll see some of the very largest planets. And indeed, I just, I can now answer the very first question we received, which was uh, from Bundaberg. Baxter, thank you for asking, what is the biggest planet in the solar system? It's Jupiter. It is the gas giant, Jupiter. It is hundreds of times the size of the Earth. Very impressive object, lots of gas. In fact, it is the biggest by mass of all the other planets put together. Essentially, um, uh, Jupiter outweighs us all. Very, very large planet. It dominates everything that's going on. So thank you for that first question. Now, um, hopefully you've noticed um, that the surface of, of the planet Jupiter is actually turning. So let's jump to Earth to start with. So there's two ways you can do that. You can either go um, to the menu below, look down and you'll see the planets arrayed and you can select them, or you can just directly try and find them somewhere in space and, and jump to them, click on them that way, but that's a little harder. So let's just go now and we click on the Earth. Now, we, of course, have a planet that is turning around, and that is one of the first changes that we, I think, are all familiar with in terms of this, this changing universe, and that is that our planet turns around so that we have a day side facing the sun. In this case, it's, it's the left-hand side of the planet, and there's a nighttime side on the right, which is where we can't see the sun, so it's dark for us. And we make a full turn of our planet in 24 hours. Now this app has uh, one hour, real-time hour is one second. So it takes about 24 seconds for the Earth to spin completely. We can also see the moon is moving around us. That moon is a, um, uh, it changes shape from our perspective on Earth. What's actually happening is we're seeing more or less of the sunlit side of the moon. And that would have been a full moon at that point where we have the sun, earth, and the moon in one line, um, a quarter moon when they form a triangle, and then finally when the moon goes between the sun and the earth, we only can see the dark shadowed side of the moon, and that is what we call a new moon, where it's just not visible to us on the sky. So I want you to note that this we have our day, and it's changing, and that's fine. It's 24 hours. Let's look to the right and look back at Jupiter and now can you see, now that we're a little closer to Jupiter, just how quickly Jupiter is spinning around. Look at those clouds, the belts of, of gas, different colors of composition, that as they spin around. This is because Jupiter goes, its day is just 10 hours. In moving incredibly, and when you're, you think of just how large this planet is, it means those clouds are absolutely gunning it around, incredibly fast rotation. So we can tell from the Earth that there is already changes because we have the day and night, the phases of the moon. We can see the position of the planets on the sky slowly change over weeks 
and months. And indeed, even their brightness changes because of the, they're reflecting more or less light. And from Tanya, um, what is weather like on Jupiter? Well, you tell me, you look there, it looks pretty windy. Uh, we have these hugely fast moving clouds. Uh, it all depends, however, exactly how far into the planet you are. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets, the higher the, the pressure. Indeed, eventually uh, it gets so hot and dense that uh, we think the gas actually gets squeezed into a solid, what we call metallic hydrogen, something extremely uh, um, difficult to even imagine what that would feel or look like, and certainly something we can't recreate on Earth. So Jupiter is a very special place. Some real interesting weather features like the great red um, spot. There it is. Oh, just zoomed by. It is a uh, essentially uh, uh, an anti-cyclone, but essentially a, a vortex, swirling vortex, like a hurricane that has been going for hundreds of years at least. And, and we see that it gobbles up other storms to keep itself going. Some very extreme weather on Jupiter. Now, um, we have uh, some other features of our night sky that we'll see change. As, as I said, the planet's positions will change, the brightness will change as they move around the sun, reflecting more or less light back to us on Earth. That's how we see a planet. Um, we've got a great question. Oh my goodness. Daniel, age six from Kingston Library. Can you see the Kuiper belt? <laughs> awesome. Um, what you're seeing right now, as you look from Jupiter back towards the sun, is the asteroid belt, the main asteroid belt that lies between um, Mars and Jupiter. And the gravity of, of Jupiter stops it from forming together to form a new planet, we think. So it's just a rocky rubble mess. A very similar... Um, uh, uh, belt of, of rock and ice is the Kuiper belt, which is at the very furthest edge of our solar system. Uh, we don't have it in this app, and that's the main reason is because it's, it's, we don't know much about the objects out there. We, we've been able to get the briefest glimpse of some of them as the New Horizons probe zoomed by. Um, but yeah, that, that is the new frontier of, of uh, astrophysicists searching our solar system. So Daniel, maybe you know you can you know be part of the the NASA crew or the Australian Space Agency crew that builds a probe that goes out to explore the Kuiper Belt directly. That would take decades to get out there. So it's good that you're so young and you can start working on it now. All right. So we've been speaking about the changes of the night sky. Um, let's have a different look now, because uh, our, what we see with our eyes is only one part of what the universe actually looks like. So Rebecca, I think it's time that we looked in a different way. Absolutely, I was just gonna jump in and say though, there is, if you're interested in the Kuiper Belt, there is a little Easter egg in ah. this app <laughs> where we had a planet that got demoted that actually represents you know, what we would say are kind of the biggest of those objects. So yes, you know, if you're interested good. in discovering things, have a, again, have a look around the scene and perhaps you'll find some really cool stuff. But yes, we have to move on because there's an entire universe that we want to explore with you all this morning. So let's, let's go back to our menu and let's tap on our home screen to return back. And we're going to jump into a different scene now. So press on your home screen. And now you should see your icons in front of you again. And so we're just going to look down and we're going to now navigate to all sky view. So once we press on that, you're going to see that, oh my gosh, now we have left the solar system and we see this dark band in front of us, which is actually our Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. And we can see all now, instead of just our sun, now we're looking at millions of stars that surround us. And we're looking at our galaxy in optical light. This is the light that we can detect with our eyes. And so we're going to now, we're going to select that little cog, that little gear looking thing on our menu. And we're going to turn on some special features so we can see some cool stuff. So press that cog, and then I want you to turn on constellations. Let's turn on points of interest. You know what? Let's turn on the ecliptic, too. So what you should see now are some, you're going to see some shapes in the sky, and you're going to notice that those shapes, we, we have names for those. And so these help us just kind of map out 
that vast field of stars that we're looking at. Let's make some order to it and let's, you know, project some shapes onto it. So that's what constellations are. Now, the ecliptic is, some, is what we just explored. That's the plane of our solar system, but that's the path we see the sun take across the sky as well as the other planets. So it's that path that we see that that's the plane of our solar system. Now we can, we can follow that ecliptic and we can go through the constellation signs, which are called the zodiac. So that's when you think of Sagittarius, Taurus, all of these different signs are constellations that our sun moves through throughout the year. So again, it's changing. The night sky that we see changes each and every day and certainly changes from month to month and over the course of the year. But we're looking at the sky in visible light. And you know what? There's a lot more to our galaxy and to our universe than just what we can see with our eyes. And so if you will click on your menu again, now you can see there's this whole, you see these wiggly lines, and those are meant to represent the wavelengths of light. So we have optical light like we see, and you know what? Optical light is just right. It's just right in the middle of the spectrum. But we have light which is more energetic, and so it's got a shorter wavelength, and we have light which is less energetic, and so it's a longer wavelength. And so let's look at some of the exciting shorter wavelength light. So if you click on X-ray, you're going to notice that your sky is going to become very different. It's going to transform. And as you look around, you're going to see now bright white hot spots. And these represent areas of immense energy. And so you have black holes that are feeding. You have stars that have exploded and have left nebula. And so now we can see traces of that energy. There's a big bright dot that's up there. And that bright dot is from a binary where two stars are, are coming together and they're blasting off X-rays. And so we can see using these different wavelengths of light just how exciting our sky is. And so I encourage you to look around and find some of these interesting events. In fact, if we switch back to the optical sky, let's follow our ecliptic line down and find the constellation Taurus. And we'll just quickly look at, at a cool object there that we can explore. So find, so switch your wavelength back to optical. And now let's find the constellation Taurus. And remember, you're gonna have to spin around to find it. So once you found Taurus, right nearby is personally my favorite constellation, and that's Orion, Orion the Hunter. And so within Orion, you will see you know, he's holding up his sword and he has his, you know, his shield, but then he's got his sword belt. And in that sword belt is an object. And so I want you to click on that object that you see there. There we go. Perfect. So what do we have here? So if we click on it again, so you see a green circle, so you know you can interact. This is Orion's nebula. And this is the birthplace of stars. So all that gas and dust like we saw in the plane of the Milky Way, now we're seeing here. And those bright lights that you see, those are stars that had just been born. So that's pretty incredible. And this though, this takes millions of years. So we're talking about the planets, you know, moving through this, moving through the sky and the ecliptic, taking days, maybe a year, maybe a few years for them to make their full orbits, whereas these things take millions of years. So this is the opposite end of the time scale. So if you press on that image again, it will disappear. And I see that we have a great question, and so I want to use this opportunity to feed into that question. So Connor has asked from Kingston Library, can the sun be blown up? Well, our sun won't actually blow up at the end of its lifetime. It will kind of pass quietly into the night. It's not that, that massive. It's pretty average. We like it, but you know, as far as stars goes, it's kind of average. And so at the end of its life, it will just kind of poof out its outer layers and they'll just gently flow out into space. But if we now follow Orion and now we go over to the right and we follow his arm, and we're gonna see that there's another object that we can click on. So let's go over and let's find that. 
object. Let's see if you can find it. There we go. Now, if you click on that object, you're going to see something very different. Whoa. This is the crab pulsar. Now, Connor, this is what it looks like when a very, very massive star, if you were paying attention earlier, Pujan, who was talking about what she studies, this is what happens when they die. They blow out all their layers in a supernova explosion, and at their very center, they'll either leave a black hole, or in this case, a pulsar. A pulsar is a special type of remnant where it's spinning super, super fast, and it's shooting out radio jets, and our radio telescopes in Australia can detect those jets as pulses of energy, and that's why they're called pulsars. So those are just a couple of the incredible things that you can explore in this scene. And I've been talking for a little bit, telling you guys all about stars, which I love. Alan, I'm gonna pass it back over to you in case you guys, you wanna show them some of the other cool things that we can explore in this scene. Yeah, absolutely. And fittingly, the Gravity Discovery Center in WA has joined us. So thank you so much for uh, tuning in all. And we're going to talk about something very close to your heart, I know, and that is the gravitational wave events. And this, this whole um, uh, National Science Week this year for us is about the changing sky. So let's see an example of the very latest uh, events. And we are running out of time, so I'm only going to do very quick. So if we go back to the menu... Uh, go down and select gravitational wave events, GW events. And there um, your phone is going to download the very latest explosions or detections from LIGO. There we go. There's some, let's just grab the second one from bottom. Uh, you can just click on any of them and then you will see a glowing, oh, there we go. It just appeared. That glowing orange color that is where we think a signal, a gravitational wave event, what we think, in this case, this is BBH. So that's um, two black holes collided together, came from somewhere over there in that direction. Super exciting because, you know, these things are being detected. Essentially, every week we get a new detection. And as our technology gets better, we're finding ever more of these things changing all the time. There's a whole other series of stuff called transients, which include fast radio bursts, supernovae, lots of other exotic, amazing things that literally go bang in the night um, that we're only just beginning to discover about. So there's so much more in this app than we have time to share with you tonight, uh, now. But let us exit because I don't want to miss out on the next thing. So we've got, if we go to the home icon, so hit the house, and then um, we'll jump into Star Lab because we had this great question about what happens with stars. So if you just jump into Star Lab, you should see you're in a console, some kind, you know, our, our funky little uh, console area, and you'll see that there are three objects in front of you. So we have a, um, a white dwarf on the left, a neutron star in the middle, and a black hole on the right. Why don't we, um, we'll click the black hole because we're running out of time. So we'll just go for that little black hole on the far right. Just click that object. And now the panel above you change. So if you just move your headset up and hopefully you'll see a very massive star, a hot white, indeed blue hot, very, very hot star. Um, massive, much larger than our sun. If you click on it in just a few tens of millions of years, it will have used up all of its fuel. It will begin to swell to become what we call a red super giant. And then this stage doesn't last very long at all. It uses up all its fuel, click once more, and we see that it erupts in an explosion and we get um, a black hole in the center. You can't see the black hole. Its gravity is so strong, not even light can escape. And Leo from Bundaberg Library has asked, how big are black holes? Well, if you took the Earth and squeezed it down until its gravity was strong enough that not even light can escape and hence become black, a black hole, we'd be the size of a marble. If you took the sun and squeezed it down, it would be a couple of kilometers across. So even the very largest black holes, like the supermassive black holes in the center of our galaxies, even those are um, barely bigger than a planet in, in size or extent. Some of the biggest ones are maybe the size of our solar system, but really on astronomical scales, that's tiny, tiny objects. They're super, super densely packed, and that's why their gravity is so large. 
They can have different shapes as they spin, they bulge out a little bit, but typically a black hole, that region we just see as usually being like a boring circle. How can you tell a black hole is there? Through its gravity. So we're going to fire the cannon. There's a big red button. Hopefully you have all resisted the temptation to press it until now. If you press it, this is a neutrino cannon. It's going to fire a ball of material out and you'll see it making an orbit around the black hole pulled by the gravity of that object, revealing its presence. Now, these things take, as I said, the stars can take hundreds of millions of years to get to this point where they form a black hole. And that whole explosion can be done in seconds, some very extreme timescales. Um, we're running out of time really badly. So maybe let's jump back to um, the menu and I will give a shout out and I won't take us through, but if we can just explore, um, jump into the LIGO room. So we'll go on the right where we can see how black holes collide. This is a navigated scene. In other words, there's instructions to follow. So you don't need me to walk you through it, but this is actually our little animation version of how you see these um, colliding black holes using essentially laser beams that shoot down two arms of a detector called LIGO. Very, very cool. We don't have time to speak to it now, unfortunately, but what we're discovering all the time as we um, learn more about the universe, yeah, hit the green button, turn the laser on. Um, <laughs> we get a, uh, a new glimpse of just how rapidly changing our universe is, like where two black holes come merging together. Um, they'll spend tens or hundreds of millions of years inching closer and closer and closer. And then at the very last second, they're doing about a hundred laps of each other each and every second. The whole thing gets an incredibly bright explosion. Um, and, it, and indeed, we hear this explosion through gravitational wave detectors like LIGO. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain more, but I believe um, later today there is the Minecraft version of the LIGO detector created by our colleagues in Adelaide at the Osgraf Center in Adelaide. Uh, it's 2 p.m. Adelaide time. Make sure to tune in. Go to the National Science Week website for more on that. Now, uh, let's jump back to the main menu because we're kind of getting to the to the end of this. We'll, we'll answer a few questions. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, I've just seen one come in. Uh, all right, I'm gonna do the wrap up and then we'll try to answer a question or two, Becca. Does that sound like a good way to do that it? That sounds good. Okay. Look, so, that's, that's, the tr that's the challenge of this is there's so much to explore. And so we just wanted to give you guys a taste today. So Alan, go for it, do our acknowledgements. So then we'll have time to answer some questions. That sounds good, okay. Look, thank you so much all for joining us. We will stay online to answer questions uh, on Twitter, Facebook. So please, please keep asking the questions. There are astronomers from around Australia. Thank you all for volunteering to uh, monitor the Ask Cyber uh, hashtag. Huge thank you to Swinburne University and to the ARC Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery, or OSGRAV, who um, support and make this app better each and every year. In particular, Lisa, Jackie, Carl, Mark, I can't believe you keep doing this year and year and you keep getting better and it does get ever better. So thank you all for your efforts and time. Huge thank you to the Inspiring Australia uh, National Science Week Grant for making this possible. Um, and of course, a massive thank you to you, Rebecca, for joining us from across the world, not even letting a global pandemic get in the way of you telling this amazing science. So thank you, Rebecca, for joining once more on this crazy, crazy science and VR experience. Happy to be part of it with this great team, including you, Alan. We just love astronomy so much. And we're just so excited to use the latest and greatest technology to help you guys appreciate all the amazing discoveries that are happening in real time. So remember, keep checking this, this gravitational wave events, they're happening every day. Stay awesome. safe. Thanks, everyone.